one of the things that I noticed uh, when I was listening to uh, Carolyn and also Vasif was, of course, how much our impressions of the art world are um, colored by uh, the environment that we are in. And I think a lot of the things that I've been saying, also uh, th that the exhibition uh, Unorthodox and this panel and some of the things I'm going to ask here, uh, uh, are definitely also um, particular to the environment of, of, of New York. Um, I wanted to perhaps kind of continue a little bit with what Karen was saying about uh, um, the time spectrum of art and I've um, always been fascinated by this idea of the end of art. I think there was an essay by Arthur Danto that was um, um, titled like this and, and remembering also from my student days um, Hans Belting's book, The Art of Art, The End of Art History, and always thinking like, is there even going to be such a thing? And, and thinking, when I was thinking about unorthodox, a lot of these sort of like themes emerged. Is, is the idea of the museum as we know it, um, perhaps just some sort of you know, temporary situation and what is going to be there to replace that. And Carolyn mentioned how the museum sort of emerged out of the library in Alexandria. And you know, in, in, in a way, of course, the museum is nothing else than a library. It's an archive. Uh, and instead of archiving books, the museum archives artwork. But in fact, it's sort of, of course, the same thing, trying to tell a story, a certain story that you know, perhaps gives us guidance and explains certain things that we are eager to know. Um, and of course, we know that this story or, or the canon that has been created has been questioned over and over again, um, uh, which is sort of like perhaps only one aspect to think about like how maybe museums have um, are in a critical situation to sort of like readdress how do we think about the canon and how do we think about um, the stories that we've been told, uh, um, that, that we have told, um, given that this sort of idea of the canon or the grand narrative of course has been sort of um, Demask as a form of illusion, and um, but to that I'm thinking, you know, I, I was I was working at the Waters Institute in San Francisco, and and um, that's part of the California College of the Arts, where I really got the first-hand experience in American art education. I was also surprised at how almost like conveyor there's an education going on that pumps out artists. And um, I, um, on the one hand, I thought it was very inspiring to be in this environment. But on the other hand, I also noticed how much there was a desire on many parts of the students to sort of you know, have a particular type of career within the art world, which I felt like you know, might, might, you know, in many ways is not, not, not going to happen. And um, as another point, in addition to that, so I'm thinking about like dismantling of the canon, uh, um, the overabundance of art education. I'm thinking also about the way that we approach art and how, it come, how, how we receive it. And, you know, most often now, not by going through the museum, but looking on, the, on, our, on, on our phones, looking at Instagram, looking at Facebook, and, and seeing artworks displayed there. So there's, again, another sort of like shift or a threat towards uh, what museums have traditionally been, been doing, exhibiting art. So there's a lot of like things, I guess, around art in museums that uh, maybe create a, a, a a situation of discomfort or distress, and that's sort of like what I wanted to, to, to sort of like address and, and just see like how uh, everyone here on the panel uh, uh, feels about. Um, I'm not going to um, introduce everybody individually since uh, the biographies are there in the um, leaflet, but just quickly, Kathy Halbrecht is the Associate uh, Director of the Museum of Modern Art. Scott Rothkopf is Chief Curator of the Whitney Museum. Asama Golden is the Director and Chief Curator of uh, the Studio Museum in Harlem. And Ruba Katri is the Chief Curator of the Sculpture Center, by default, since you're the only curator. Well, there's, a, there's a Chief Curator. Oh, there is? Mm -hmm. Executive Director and Chief Curator. Okay, so yeah. Curator. <laughs> <laughs> so well, why don't we begin with, with you then? Wait, Ants, what was your question? Well, I was just thinking about, like, about all the different sort of aspects that <laughs> perhaps threaten, well, not threaten, but kind of oh, okay. maybe make us rethink what the function and role of the museum is. Um, um, you know, as I mentioned, the yeah. sort of, yeah, okay. I think I got it. I'm, so I'm the curator at Sculpture Center, and I guess I can start by talking a little bit about my institution which has the name sculpture in it so it sounds like it's medium spe specific it's a mid-scale institution in Long Island City Queens and I think um, these are some of the aspects of the institution that are really important but also speak to its specificity as an institution and I think that's something that is very important today as a lot of museums and institutions are trying to do it all and be it all especially in the United States um, and to have an, an organization, and there's other 
organizations here that, that I think can, and can speak to that, that grounds itself in something really specific and concrete and can and has a position of sorts and can push against that and follow that along. Um, and also the scale I think is really important because mid-scale is increasingly rare and I'm not talking about like a small alternative space and I'm not talking about a large museum, maybe collecting institution. So at Sculpture Center we do talk about ourselves as like a Kunstala model, but that scale is really a tough place to be in. Um, it's an exciting place to be in, but it's also tough because we were not, um, our overhead is higher than an, a small alternative space, so we need to raise money and get, gain that attention, but we, um, our shows are actually really ambitious and we have the um, resources to do something perhaps beyond what a small alternative space could be. And of course, in that configuration, um, we, you know, we just don't have the name recognition as like a MoMA or Whitney. Um, so I think that's maybe an answer to your question so far. Yeah, and I think that kind of specificity is really important. Selma. What's the question? <laughs> the, what's the question? Mm -hmm. No, uh, specifically. OK, you know? specifically. Yeah. All right, I'll be a bit more specific. Mm -hmm. Because I, before I said I didn't really want to be too overly critical and lament too much. And, but um, I really wonder sometimes what, what, where, where we are going. I'm working on a book right now. It's called Futurism. It has nothing to do with the art, for, um, art movement Futurism. It's mm -hmm. just about like, thinking about what is art going to be in the future, and is there even going to be such a thing as art, and how do we react to that, and then what are the reasons for why this might not longer exist. Um, um, do, you, do, you, do you have any similar notion, or, or am I just completely on my own there? Um. I'm not going to say you're on your own, um, but perhaps I would say that what my concern is is not necessarily the question of a future or what the future of art might be, but more perhaps about what the future of institutions might be, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. So um, as the director of an institution that created itself, um, not, I was Gadda Carolyn, you know, sort of formed, you said this periphery center kind of thing is almost racist. I'll take out the almost, mm -hmm. okay, from your sentence. Mm -hmm. um, and say it is because, you know, I work at an institution that was founded really in many ways as a challenge, right, to the idea of the present of institutions in that moment, 1968, critical moment for a sense of challenge on all levels, right? So to also the question that came up earlier about, you know, what are we meant to be and how are we engaging as institutions, we can be engaged in what are the larger sort of cultural shifts and struggles. So I think more about as we are in a space of thinking about what the future of institutions are, we have to, in the present, redefine what are our very narrow ideas about what this institutional landscape really looks like and how it really plays out and how it really exists. And in some ways we are caught in a very narrow dialogue that is about periphery and center, big and small. You know, all, all of these things that I'm not quite sure get us, either individually in our own institutions or as a field, any further in thinking about transformation and change. Well, I think part of this question that I'm um, thinking about is also that I see that there's so much art produced mm -hmm. and um, museums continue to collect all this work, but where does it all go? Um, I, we are in the moment planning a rehang of our collection and I realized that over the last 25 years since the uh, permanent collection has been up there, we have only shown about 400 works, but we have actually 30,000 works in the collection and we're adding constantly mm -hmm. to them. Um, and um, many of them will probably never see the light of day. Mm -hmm. um, and that might just be because perhaps right now they're not relevant. I always think about this idea of permanent relevance and temporary mm -hmm. importance mm -hmm. and, and, and how do we sort of like balance that. Um, Scott, you're working in a museum that just reopened with a big grand exhibition of the, of the collection. And um, I think some of the things that I might have said before sort of are kind of contrary to, to this particular approach that you have tried to outline there sort of like American artistic canon, even though I like the exhibition a lot. Yeah, well, I, um, I think that we, in a funny way, you know, the Whitney, is, when you said 30,000 objects, we actually have a smaller collection than you do. We have about 22,000 objects. And I think that we didn't really know... We have like about 50,000 Torah pointers. Oh. <laughs> <Okay>. 15,000. <laughs> we have a deep in that area. 
Um, I think we didn't really know what our um, collection was actually, unlike I think some museums uh, like the Metropolitan or MoMA, which have a kind of longer history since their foundings in presenting narratives in their collection in more continuous ways, which of course they may be refining and updating. The Whitney um, had devoted a, a lot of its um, time, energy, money uh, in recent years space to uh, its temporary exhibition program more than its you know, showing the collection. I think people didn't really even know what the great icons of the, the canonical works of the Whitney's collection were almost as um, unknown to some people as the unknown works of the Whitney's collection, and including to the curators. And we spent a lot of time uh, digging around in the storage. And I think that we, we decided from the beginning that we did not want to take um, an approach that kind of threw everything up in the air or turned everything upside down. So maybe it seemed like an orthodox approach to the extent that it was largely chronologically driven, that it was taken from our collection, that most of the things in our collection sort of behave like works of art as we, as we know them. But I think that it was um, revisionist in, in our thinking to the extent that we included many uh, figures in that show that uh, had not been seen or heard from in many, many years. Mm -hmm. We, uh, you know, people kept saying to me, well, who's in and who's out before the museum opened? And I said, well, do you mean who's out based on the kind of white male artists with big markets that you might expect to see, like Clifford Still? Like, okay, he's not there. Uh, or do you mean all the other <coughs> artists that are in storage who could be in that you're not thinking about? So in a way, that question, um, I thought, presupposed that people had a canon in their minds that we represented, which I didn't feel that we did, in fact. And so throughout the exhibition, uh, you know, we included work on paper. Uh, people would say, oh, or how, you know, how enthralled are you in the market or something? I would guess that 25% of the works in that show you know, might fail to sell at a day sale at Christie's, actually. <laughs> I mean, honestly, if I think about some of the prints from the 1930s or um, you know, works like that. So I feel that uh, even though it might have resembled a kind of traditional exhibition, I think a lot of the, the voices that were included, the way that we thought about who an American artist was or wasn't, uh, the idea of shifting emphasis in a kind of subtle way that the biggest painting in the Abex room was was by Lee Krasner, um, you know, not an unknown artist, but it wasn't the Clifford Still or the Mark mm -hmm. Rothko. Uh, the fact mm -hmm. that the show, although we didn't advertise it, was 20% uh, mm -hmm. artists of color, um, something that we were proud of in our thinking uh, for a museum that is creating a narrative that goes 115 years. That's sometimes hard to do, given that most of our pre-war collection are you know, white men. Uh, so in a funny way, if you do it well like that, then nobody notices and they're still kind of complaining. And you're kind of saying, well, maybe we should have said in our press release, here are all the points that we differ from the canon that you think we represent. Um, and that's something I've thought a lot about in, in retrospect. So maybe it's a kind of hybrid model where on the one hand, uh, it, it looks a little orthodox to some people, but uh, in, in other ways, I think that there were a lot of um, strong, uh, arguments in the mm -hmm. exhibition about mm -hmm. you know even who counts as an American artist, artists who were not considered American by prior generations of Whitney curators and directors. So we, we tried to, to do that as best we could. Well, <laughs> even though it seems like uh, it goes without saying that you would open the new building of a museum with its collection, I thought that was probably the most unorthodox thing of all, that you open with your collection, given that um, I feel that many museums completely underutilize their collection, and there could be so much more done with the collection. Mm -hmm. Also, thinking about how much resources go towards maintaining a collection, interpreting mm -hmm. and managing a collection. Um, the elephant MoMA. in the yeah. room. <laughs> <laughs> what about MoMA? Um, I mean, I, look. You know, I think that, you know, MoMA stands for a particular type of institutions. People say, oh, it's a lot of blockbuster exhibitions and this and that. And I mean, obviously, as someone who's very closely looking at exhibitions, I know that it's not necessarily the case. Um, but um, how, do you, how do you keep up with, like, artistic progress? Uh, and, and intellectual rigor while having to navigate this um, ocean liner of a museum? Well, I'm going to try today to migrate myself between MoMA and Walker, where I was for 16 years. Um, and they're very different uh, institutions, and I think this question of orthodoxy is a really site-specific question. I think that's what you are trying to say. Mm -hmm. I think that, um, curiously, Maybe this is just my general psychological state. I am a melancholy optimist. 
So I look out at an audience who's here on a Sunday where really we should all be in the park, who actually are interested in this question. So for me, I may, uh, I think there are a lot of false assumptions um, about all of us, mm -hmm. but um, I actually don't think any of us get up in the morning to fool anybody. I think we get up because maybe the two biggest questions that we've talked around but we haven't really addressed is, you know, why do we matter and to whom? And I think we've talked very little about to whom today. Um, I actually think, um, having worked in Minneapolis for 16 years, it was an entirely civic-minded place. I was kind of shocked when I came to New York about how little civ civic conversation there was. Um, and I think, to go back to the earlier panel today, there was um, a kind of, um, I found, the only thing I found really troubling was this sort of lassitudinous idea about audience, you know. Um, a, tourists are evil. B, um, it's, it's okay to not think about our audience. Both of which I think are um, on the surface m mildly okay, but right below the surface really troubling. And um, I also believe that while having been a director as well as a curator, for me, the idea of, as Vasif mentioned, how we structure our institutions are very, very key. I'm not the director. All I am is the in-house irritant. Um, and at the same time, I hope I'm a bit of a mentor by asking sometimes troubling questions. The biggest troubling question I have about um, we do do a lot of data um, on our audiences. Um, I think the last thing it's really useful for is what exhibitions we do, but it is very uh, useful at figuring out, given that a third of our budget comes from admissions, where the softening is gonna be so that we can prepare as intelligently as possible for highs and lows. Um, what we, I mean, there's a, a kind of mythology about MoMA that um, we're actually more scientific than we are. It's really a place where a lot of passions reign. Now, I also would be disingenuous if I didn't say that we didn't think about in the selection of which passions are foregrounded. Um, who our audience is, and um, the balance. I mean, I would say that's what we're looking for, is a kind of ample history, but a balance. The other thing I guess I would say is, okay, so if um, MoMA begins to really do the kind of research it has done, and one of the things I think that was important to me when I came to MoMA was to think about how really the canonical is only Bill Rubin. It's not MoMA. And if you look at you know, our history, it's actually more porous, more interesting, more, more pieces. But you know, we are coming off the years of Bill Rubin even though Glenn has been there forever. Um, and I thought the thing that we needed to do was a kind of quiet research. Um, so we really did look at three parts of the world that had had some connection to MoMA, but that we hadn't really pursued with a kind of equal rigor to other parts. And those were Eastern Europe, Japan, and Latin America, um, in particular Brazil. The thing that's different about this from other institutions is that this was not about really shopping. And each of these groups, and there are about 45 curators involved in this, plus educators, plus librarians, plus archivists, really was to um, spend three years thinking about this. And I think this is the great luxury of MoMA, 
is that, you know, it wasn't one trip and we're done. We really, we've been to all the galleries. We know who the collectors are and it's over. This was really sort of understanding the histories, the, 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 the problems, the economics of these very complicated places. I will say it pains me to think of this as colonialist um, because my question would be, and I'll stop here, if, would it be better if we didn't care at all yeah, no, I think Caroline brought this up before as a sort of complicated situation where on the one hand we seem to, we have to care because we want to um, introduce these um, other parts of the world and the work that has been done there to um, the audiences here and to introduce them to the canon that we created um, or maybe not even to the canon, just simply to the discussion of contemporary or modern art. And, and in many cases, um, some of those countries do not have the facilities to actually take care of the artworks in an appropriate way so that they're actually going to last. I organized this exhibition here, Other Primary Structures, which looked at um, minimal art from the 60s. And many of the works, um, and some of you have might seen the show, um, had to be recreated simply because the artist told me, well, there was no museum that wanted to uh, keep this, and I had no place to store it. So I destroyed it. So I have to remake it. So now we have the opportunity since there's a lack of institutional structures in Latin America, Africa, Asia, to, to uh, store these works. But I also understand But I think there the is criticism. another, I, I understand it, but I think, um, for example, with Eastern Europe, after a period of time, we recognized that the museum in Wuch was a place that um, had great works of art that MoMA actually never could acquire, but that would amplify the story of modernism that we told, and we had works that would be valuable to them. So part of this research became developing this long-term relationship where their curators come and study the collection and our curators go and study their collection, and there will come a partnership, a, some kind of intervention within our collections that is, um, about what we've learned from each other. And I guess I'm naive in thinking this, but I really think that everything we do is really about relationships. Ruba, you work in a very different situation than uh, MoMA or the, or the Whitney. Um, and um, I was asking Cassie at the beginning about how to keep um, up with uh, artistic progress or how to even sort of maybe foster that, inspire that. Um, what do you see really as a primary objective of, of the Sculpture Center, given that you have the flexibility to react very fast? And I know you're someone who's always out and about looking at a lot of work, looking at a lot of artists that sort of like are emerging. Mm, well, you know, in thinking about this, I was considering, I was remembering a conversation I had with the um, artist Nairi Bagramian I don't, a couple years ago, and I don't remember when she told me this, but she was talking about how um, proposals kill art. And it's just an interesting sentiment. And I don't want to put more words in her mouth than that. She um, you know, is in a casual conversation. But, um, but it's something that has stuck with me, I think, in part because it, it touches on um, a kind of bureaucratic method in terms of, uh, which comes from an institutional structure, which comes from you know, funding structures, which has like a long a sort of trickle down, um, and I think you know this idea of the propo the proposal or coming up with a fixed thing that you're working with. I mean, it's some institutions and museums have to do that, but at Sculpture Center, we can really and you know I can really work with artists in developing ideas, and that's something I I really value and um, find to be a, you know I'm, I feel very fortunate and feel like that's a great opportunity and and that I can work with an artist and they can have an idea that's not even fully formed for a show and that I can follow that through with them and have those discussions and conversations and, and back and forth and that I can leave room and space for something that is unexpected within an exhibition and I would say that's almost half of what's going on at, you know, in the shows that I do and also at Sculpture Center depending on the context of course and I would also say that that's because I've been fortunate enough to work in institutions and with 
um, directors who trust me enough as a curator to let me trust artists. And I think that's, that's you know, not for everyone, but it's something that is, it's a space that's very important to maintain and, and protect. No, I think this is ex something extremely valuable, and, and I, I've noticed since I've been working here, for example, that, that it's not ne necessarily a given. You know, given the, the structures of large institutions, those possibilities or open-endedness is sometimes uh, simply not possible. Uh, Selma, with the Studio Museum, you have a particular mission, of course, um, to look uh, particularly at uh, works done by African-American artists. Has, has that ever limited you in anything that you wanted to do to be so culturally specific? Well, um, our mission is actually artists of African descent. So that includes African American artists, but artists of African ancestry all over the world. Um, so in many ways, actually, after being a curator for over a decade at the Whitney, it was incredibly liberating in some ways that my focus became one that was not bound necessarily by geography, but truly global and international. What's interesting about it is the question often gets framed because the black part is what makes often people begin to see narrowness mm. because of the space in which black artists hold, right, within our artistic canons, so that it's hard to imagine a worldview in which thinking about artists of African descent is actually endless possibility for me curatorially. So no, I do not find it. It's a long way to say no. I do not find that a limit. It is truly you know, my greatest possibility. And I think yeah. that in our founding in 68, it always, even though at the time we were founded as an institution, it was with the premise that quite possibly we could remain the only institution mm. devoted to this in this way. You know, that was sort of the fierce, fierce, fierce faith of the founders that said, well, even if the art world does not open and change, we will still here create a worldview in which this idea of artists of African descent as our core will not be one that is narrow, but one that is wide. And but so. Thelma, the other thing that you do brilliantly yeah. is train people, some of right. whom end up working at our institutions, thankfully, but- well, Purposefully. Uh, yes. You know, uh, it's a plan, it's a plot. <laughs> I, I know, I'm willing to admit it, it is, it is. I mean, but it's a very, mm -hmm. it's, it's an extremely necessary part, I mm -hmm. think, of the whole institutional mm -hmm. identity. Scott, you're probably gonna like uh, what I'm gonna say. Um, but since the Whitney has moved downtown, audience figures have dropped here on the Upper East Side. And um, you guys have really upped your game with this new building in a very specific location at a very particular moment in, in, in time and the development of a particular area of the city as well. Um, and there's a sort of a shift, I think, in, in terms of um, attention, even though, of course, the Whitney was always among the most visited and, and most popular museums uh, in New York. I would say now, um, you know, you are probably one of the top two or three museums in the city. And, and, and I wonder how this has changed in terms of size, in terms of importance, in terms of audience figures, um, in terms of programs, perhaps. Um, how has this changed uh, your, your identity? How has it changed your thinking about museums? How has it changed your uh, um, thinking about programming? If it has changed at all from medicine down to uh, meatpacking? You know, I mean, in, in a, I think we're still Trying to come to terms with what we, your uh, mic is my mic not working. Yeah, take two. <laughs> oh, oh, well, I, my <laughs> mic was not working. Um, <laughs> now it is. Uh, I, I think, you know, the first thing I should say is that we're still trying to come to terms with what this museum is that we've become because you can do a lot of planning for years and you can open and then the thing that exists and the way it's received is you know sort of so different from even what you could imagine and we certainly have become a much much more visited institution uh, than we ever were uh, in a way that's I think kind of overwhelming to all of us when we walk in the, the door each day who work there um, and in a funny way I think I feel like everything's changed and nothing's changed and by uh, Everything, I mean, that we're kind of grappling with this new notion of an expanded audience, with the stage on which we're acting, um, 
with the fact that actually the way that we exhibit artworks physically will have to change, that one of the things people used to like about coming to the Whitney was that it wasn't crowded. Those few people who did enjoyed that they were part of a few uh, and that we didn't have to glaze our paintings or put stanchions everywhere, that some of the core values of the institution in terms of the kind of relationships we wanted to foster to artworks um, we could maintain in ways that we're gonna have to really think about and the ways that we can learn a lot from MoMA and how they've thought about it. On the other hand, in terms of programming specifically, so far, kind of nothing's changed. I mean, we've just opened a show this past week where we've, um, you know, are gonna devote our 18,000 square foot floor to five exhibitions in under three months. And the gesture of doing something that still feels um, experimental and light on its feet and weird and maybe unlike some of our peer institutions at the level that you're now claiming that we're a part of, um, that, that we want to keep those values close, that we want to keep being advocates for artists like David Warnerovich or Carmen Herrera or whoever it was, that in a certain way, uh, a central part of our mission remains. And I think we kind of know who we are as an institution in a way that I'm proud of and I hope we can continue to be the way that we were before, but in a kind of different and new way. So. Um, it's, you know, will remain to be seen over the next few years, whether these crowds keep coming, uh, you know, what this new context means, how we speak to different people. I was thinking about what you said, Kathy, about audience. For me, the biggest shift um, in my experience, which now is kind of being doubled here, was when I w worked at Artform. I was an editor there for six years before moving to the Whitney. And one of the great privileges of working at Artform was that my audience was just the art world, or, or art students, artists, uh, professors, curators, my community. And I liked working at a place that spoke to that community rather than, let's say, I didn't choose to work at the New York Times, although I respect that paper. That, you know, I, I enjoyed the specificity of my audience. And in coming to the Whitney, I immediately had to think of a, a much bigger audience than the art world, an audience that was literally 100 times bigger. And now that audience is four or five times bigger than it was. And so if I want to continue to talk in a certain way, I might have to consider whether I want to be working at a different museum, like the one that, that Massimiliano works at, where he's saying, I really appreciate talking to this uh, self-selecting audience. And I don't um, think that that's his problem or the wrong way of thinking about it. I just have to now think about who we are and how we can continue um, to talk in a way that feels authentic to us, even though we have a lot more people, let's say, listening. Um, so. I, I mean, just to sort of backtrack to Walker for a second, I think sometimes we try to make audience and program a binary. But actually, I, I learned, um, partially because when I became a director, I realized it was impossible to curate. Just, I don't know how you do it, Thelma. I don't, because you told me not to. <laughs> I do. <laughs> um, but, uh, and why did I tell you that? Right. Um, but, but the thing that we share, I think, is this sense that in order to really diversify an audience. You have to spend as much intellectual capital doing that as you do anything else you do in the institution. And I think one of the things I learned, and you know, it's, it's, it is hard to drive this at MoMA, I, I have to say, um, but one of the things I learned is that you really have to take a holistic look. It's not that I just want to have more people of color come to my institution. It's who do I do business with? Where do I advertise? And clearly also who is my staff? And I think we all are a bit lacking in um, you know, the fullness of whom our staffs could be, which does change. You know, it's like your question to Thelma. Um, it, it does change what your program, what your passions are and what gets put forward. So I would, I don't know how to, I mean, I'm, I'm sort of with Tom Finkelpearl that it's a really big question for New York institutions, paradoxically, because in Minnesota when I got there and I, they said, well, this is how many people come, and I went, great, and how many people of color are there in this? And I was told, oh, we don't count them. And I thought, wow, that, talk about invisibility. 
And it became really um, uh, part of our mission. And I think it has to be. I mean, I, I wish, I think we can talk about art all day, and I love it, and it's what brought me into museums, but my relationship to museums became more complex when I became a director. And I had to think about who was it that I was serving. And I think, you know, um, Walker maintained an equilibrium between a kind of um, visibility in the art world and, and becoming actually much more diverse. It began to actually track with local statistics. But that had to do with everything with the, whom we showed and, and whom we commissioned. And I think, you know, MoMA's at a quite an early stage, I would say, in thinking about this. Yeah. And, um, you know, again, going back to this idea of partnerships, I don't think we can do all of this alone. I think we do really need each other. And um, a very small program that um, Glenn and Thelma have developed is a, a partnership in training for young people. Two will be starting, two have started at MoMA, two have started at the Studio Museum, and then they will exchange positions so that these four people will have a very full idea of what institutions can be. I don't know what, I mean. I think that was a sort of, you know, organic response to what really are some of the challenges to say that in principle, when we begin talking about ourselves as institutions, how we want to change, how we want to do in partnership, how we bring together our mutual goals, and this was one way, right, to surface something that very informally um, had mm -hmm. been a real priority of mine, that together with Glenn's sort of commitment towards the idea that together we could do this, that we could create what essentially is a pathway. Because really what we were addressing is the lack of diversity in the field, particularly in the curatorial field, has to do with a lack of access to opportunity, very simply. And if we could change that, even in a small way, we could begin to talk differently about the possibilities for a future. I also thought it was about inequality between our institutions in a way. I mean, when I first started to talk to Gwen about it, I was very aware that Thomas Lacks was coming downtown, and I thought- Yeah, but that was a great thing. That was a fantastic thing. But it was also uh, more taking in a certain way than potentially training people together. Mm -hmm. And no, it was, as you know, I wrote you and said, um, I hope you're proud and not only pissed, but. Um, not, not, not pissed at all, but what it did and what it does is it creates more of a way, I mean, for me, it's also just a question of really in a practical way when we start talking about institutional models, the idea of being able to be trained in two different kinds exactly. of institutional models, yeah, which was very much my experience. You know, my training really came at the Whitney Museum. I was trained in a big institution mm -hmm. with a very particular history, this amazing collection with a group of curators who were doing incredibly, incredibly transformative work in the 90s, and that's what set the path for me then to become the chief curator at the Studio Museum and to create a curatorial department that could begin to look at not only our own program, not only who we would serve in our audiences, but also to think about, again, how to change the field. Mm -hmm. So quite purposefully, the goal would be to have curators, all of them, Thomas Latz, Naomi Beckwith, Christine mm -hmm. Kim, you know, all of them, come through our department and leave, go to other institutions, to then open up another opportunity within the institution. So the partnership is really an extension of core work at the institution mm -hmm. around rethinking curatorial training. Definitely an unorthodox thing when you think about curatorial training and, um, mm -hmm. um, yeah. Wait, Scott, you... you yeah, I yeah. just I wanted to... It's, it's on. Is it on? No, no, no. You have to press a button, I think. I, I was pressing. No, we pressed the Oh, okay. Well, here. Press harder. <laughs> uh, okay, I don't know. Th Thelma and I. We, no, you know, I, feel, yeah. I feel like I'm now running for office or something. Uh, you know, I just wanted to. Jens, when, when um, I was thinking back on, on your question about the transformation of the museum and also a little bit about the kind of different types of institutions that were being um, suggested by Ruba, by. I mean, in a way. People say, oh, the Whitney is you know, like MoMA, but in fact, we, we may be, I'm, I'm talking about the scale of the institution, the size of the budget, the size of the staff, the size of the collection. 
closer in some ways to the studio museum in a funny way in terms of percentages relatively. But in thinking about that, I thought I wanted to make also a plea in this conversation for the, the notion of the orthodox museum in certain ways not being bad. And that when people look at the Whitney and they see this big new museum and they can decide we did it for money or tourists or whatever they want or having more exhibition space. You know, I gave a tour to a very well-known collector who has a kind of private museum space and they said, well, what kind of, what's the percentage of gallery space in this building? And I said something like 25%. And, you know, this collector said, oh God, you know, that just shows how wasteful museums are, that only 25% of your space is program space. And I, I said, you know, I really disagree with you on that because in fact, uh, what we got was like an enclosed loading dock that we didn't have and a work on paper study center and a conservation lab and, and offices for editors and offices for art handlers who are part of a union, some of whom have worked at the Whitney for 20 years and they, they know the physical characteristics of the objects that they care for, whether it's a Calder mobile or a, you know, a weird sculpture that might fall over that they worked with artists in biennials and they, they carry this forward in the DNA of the institution and when one looks at traditional museums and compares them just to Kunsthalles, let's say, because you're only looking at the program, you're kind of forgetting that there are all these other things that separate museums in their most orthodox sense uh, from um, you know, other kinds of cultural institutions or places where one goes to look at art. And those things um, matter to me in terms of this conversation of expertise. And I think that they're the first things that can go. I think we saw that at a place like LA MoCA. Like the easiest thing to do is to bring in your art handlers uh, every time you're installing an exhibition because why keep them on the payroll or I give them health insurance all the rest of the time? Why have editors sitting in offices editing your object labels when you could shop that out? Uh, why have um, you know this kind of institutional expertise and care? And I'm, one of the things I'm the most jealous of about MoMA, apart from like, you know, their great Pollock, is how much Glenn and Kathy invest in research and in behind the scenes work and scholarship that isn't actually manifest in, in the program, which is in fact, again, proportionally far more than, than we do. We're kind of just kind of trying to keep our heads above water in terms of maybe having, you know, 10 curators programming this building compared to, I don't know how many you have. 50. 50, okay, so there you go. If we're talking about the numbers and proportions. So, <laughs> so I, but I want to argue. But we also have 150,000 works to care for. You got a lot. So again, so you proportionally, we have 20,000. Yeah. So, but, but all I'm trying to say is that we have to, understand that, that a lot of what happens behind the scenes, a lot of what happens in these big facilities, a lot of what is expensive that museums spend a lot of money on is valuable to me and the orthodox notion of the museum. And it is something that I think is increasingly imperiled by a certain kind of budget cuts, by ideas about um, not needing that kind of expertise or maintaining those standards. And I would argue um, as much as we should take radical uh, approaches to our field and to the institutions in which we work, that we shouldn't kind of throw out the baby with the bathwater and that there are these principles that are worth maintaining or bringing forward. Well, I think they're also very important to artists. I mean, I think there are many ways to serve artists. And I think actually, you know, even just at this table, there's a real, thankfully, palette of opportunities. But, you know, I think when I took a group of artists to the conservation lab, they were totally floored. I mean, mm. and I think the kind of intimacy that comes from restoring somebody's work is very much what a conservation lab is about and its relationship with artists. I just, I just wanted to jump on that, too, because I, I think what we're getting at and what's been coming up is that there's a lack of, I think, either education or understanding of the different types of institutions that exist, and it's increasingly um, confusing, I think, as lines are blurring and institutions are changing, they're in a transformative space, a time, um, moment, a lot of them, and then also, you know, the commercial sector as well, you know, there's a lot of blurring there, and I think many people, I'm just anecdotally and generally <laughs> speaking, but they, you know, there isn't an, a deep understanding of what these, of what each institution is doing, what they represent, what their mission is, and what's happening behind the scenes, and and what their function is. And I know, you know, with Sculpture Center, people don't understand mm -hmm. what we're doing and how we're different from the Whitney or White Columns, you know, and and why and what what's our purpose. And so that's something that I encounter regularly, um, you know, with art students, um, you know, patrons, etc. 
I'm glad, um, just going quickly back to what Scott said, um, that you brought that up, because I think what I perhaps think about as, as orthodoxy is, is, has more to do with, with voices that deem themselves authoritative. Uh, uh, voices or positions that have no doubt about mm. w where they stand. Um, and um, Vasif said something very nice about this b before, how, how exhibitions are fragile, how, how, uh, how they're modest. And, and, and I think that's more sort of like the, 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 the direction I'm coming from, you know, um, that, that um, there's a lot to be explored, and, and in, in many cases, um, we have these authoritative voices that just create a sort of very homo homogenous uh, situation in, in the museum spaces. Um, but that's where I disagree with you. Oh, okay. I don't think they're that homogenized. If you look at the institutions you brought together today, I think their programs are quite distinct. The, their structures are very distinct. Mm -hmm. And some of us are not ambivalent about being authoritative. About being what? Authoritative. Yeah. For having a position. Yeah, not at all. <laughs> I think that's, a, I, but I think you should. Yeah, yeah, maybe you can elaborate on that. Yeah. Well, because I just think that, you know, to speak of this, we also, you know, I mean, I'm, I'm thinking about what Scott just said about, you know, not wanting necessarily to give up the museum, right, as a concept, that, that this idea that maybe we challenge it is appropriate, but for some of us, it's actually about not giving it up at all, mm. right? It's about building it. it. Completely, right, literally, but also, you but know. But transforming it at the same time while you go along, not keeping with standards of the past, but constantly reevaluating where you stand and then moving forward. Yes, but with an understanding that that reevaluation does not always accept a past mm. as the base from which one might work, right? Yeah. So that's why I know there is a sort of institutional space now that says that perhaps letting go of a certain kind of authority is what creates a more authentic, right, experience of how we understand art. And for some of us, that is actually the opposite, right, of a kind of mission-driven sort of intellectual ideal of the institution itself. I meant as less in regards to the mission of a museum, but more in terms of um, authoritative voices who tell us what it is that we are supposed to look at. Exactly. Right. Yeah. Exactly. But if there are enough voices telling you to look at enough different things, maybe it's not so bad to have... I mean, I, I think... I actually think expertise is fugitive along with oh, yeah. exhibitions. Mm -hmm. um, and I think what we really should be thinking about is how to engender greater self-criticality within our institutions. Exactly. And that gets mm -hmm. back yeah. to the culture of a place. And I remember, again, when I was at Walker, one of my staff members saying to me, I hope you understand that a great part of our compensation is our ability to be creative. And actually, I worked very hard at that. Mm -hmm. And I think that's, again, to go back to Vasif's uh, uh, analysis, some of which I agree with and some of which I don't, which he knows. Um, I do think how we structure ourselves mm -hmm. is, is very telling. Mm -hmm. And you know, even at a place like MoMA, there's a lot of conversation about the departmental structure. And I think it's beginning to blur a little. I'm, you know, very impatient, and I don't know why it's taking us so long, but um, probably because of certain issues of power that are very hard to erase a little. But, yeah. Um, no, I share this impatient uh, um, aspect with you as well, and um, I think that's also why we are trying to build this program here at the museum with an orthodox exhibition, the book, and, and all the talks, and I'm getting signals from Jenna that um, we are ready for a Q&A. So please feel free to ask uh, any questions that you might have for our panel. Ruba, by the way, could you imagine um, you one day walking in one of those big museums? Or Hello. Is, is the place where you are right now sort of uh, the situation that you find ideal? Um, I mean, I've worked in I mean, like I've worked in a collecting institution and worked on acquisitions. Again, it was a. It wasn't a big museum. It was a staff of at Mocha in Miami. Mm -hmm. There's a staff of under 20 there, and currently I work with a staff of eight. So <laughs> there's something I like about that. Um, I like that intimacy and in the conversation, and and I think it just it's it's really. I mean, I'm I'm an exhibition-oriented curator. I know that about myself, so I really like to do 
exhibitions. And so at the moment, that's something that I feel an institution like Sculpture Center at that scale is really, um, it's really, I think, an ideal setting to do that. Yeah, it's a great flexibility there. Hello. Um, oh yeah, I'm now the, the Whitney question question is going to come. from the last panel who didn't got answer my question regarding the Whitney Museum. And I really think I got misunderstood and no one wanted to respond to my question for some kind of uh, uncomfortable, uh, being uncomfortable about the question. But to me, what I was trying to pose is like in these um, craziness of museum extensions and continual growth, I think actually that the Whitney has made a very point in case of trying to combine from one side the pressures of the economic situation of the restoration of like uh, one commercial and a touristic area but with a lot of decency and I wanted like seriously I wrote an article on it called the Whitney effect like the Bobour effect comparing it a bit to uh, the Pompidou Renzo Piano Pompidou how this is a much more successful because of less naive and all the experience on, in the museum world and I really sincerely wanted to know uh, what these uh, um, like new building, new economical situation, like this upgrading is affecting and how is this responding in the museum inside? It was not at all a critique, but on the contrary, like uh, I think it's a very successful operation. Um, well, thank you. Uh, <laughs> I'm glad you do. Uh, and, and uh, you know, I think maybe I spoke to some of that already, but you know, the two things I might add is that one, when we did purchase this site from the city, um, many people thought it was like a crazy place to move and that we were leaving the proximity of Museum of Mile, we were leaving the proximity of our donors who basically all live in this zip code. The High Line um, was, we knew it was gonna happen, but it, it hadn't opened, so nobody knew that there were gonna be five million people down there. Uh, Dia had originally intended to have the site, so they you know, should get credit in kind of imagining that that could be a, a place for uh, a museum and, and the previous administration helped us come, but uh, in a funny way, the whole situation kind of changed while we were building. So we were kind of responding to a context while we were designing something that, that kept growing. And I'm not sure that our opening has affected the context as much as people might think in terms of, especially when you look at the visitation of the High Line, but that's something we have to, to really study. Um, the other thing that uh, you know I wanted to add about that is that we definitely, um, thought about the neighborhood and the city. And, you know, I think that mm. our architect thought about that. So when you're speaking about Bobor, he thought about it in different ways, but he, he, we wanted to make a building that physically had a different kind of relationship to the city than any museum we had seen in Manhattan, let's say, in terms of the views, the kind of transparency, the lobby, the way that the outdoor space opened. I mean, it's easier to do that on our site than it would have been at MoMA where you're surrounded by a lot of tall buildings and a garden. So some of the kind of urbanistic uh, aspects of it weren't just like, do tourists come here, now we're in the meatpacking district, but how and kind of um, subtle, it's not the, the most radical building you've ever seen, but that it could um, be responsive to the city and the site in ways that um, were very special and different from uh, the Guggenheim. I mean, but wasn't, there was a radicality to it, I think, in Piano's idea that the real views should not be the water, which I think would have been the standard approach, but in fact, back into the city. Yeah, that the funny anecdote is that when he first showed the model to our board and the director, I think our board, uh, our director said, "Oh, but you you forgot that the, you put the terraces on the wrong side. The the river's over here." And Renzo said, "No, you have to look out on the city and kind of bow down to the city and step down to the city in that way and engage that context visually." And that was actually very inspiring to us when we made, we made the opening exhibition, thinking about the way that many of the artworks in the show actually reflected the kind of cultural history of New York, whether it was you know, the life of the peers, whether it was uh, the life of um, the West Village, which artists lived there, where Hopper painted. So we, we tried to think about that context in a very specific way. You know, I think on this, excuse me, on this question of expansion, it does also go to where 
these ideas are about the civic. Um, Kathy mentioned that, you know, like what that means. I mean, we are currently building a building on 125th Street. And in many ways, the context in which even we are saying we are creating a new studio museum on 125th Street are very different than the 125th Street we moved on to mm. in 1968 or in this building when we moved in 79. And so the reality of a Whole Foods opening on our corner in May and commercial galleries opening every week up in Harlem I know already creates for some an idea, again, of this projection, right, around site and space, but some of that is also about the claiming of a space, right? We were founded in 68 at a moment as part of the very real desire for economic development in a neighborhood that did not have it. We were seen as an active partner in that, that the idea that a cultural anchor could be a catalyst for economic, educational, you know, and civic growth in a neighborhood. And so, you know, fast forward to this moment, the idea of, say, being a tourist magnet is one that actually is not c considered not only not a bad thing, but an ideal. Right of 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 this I of this idea of this building that we are building that you know David Ajay is designing thinking about it with that as a goal and a goal to do with integrity but also one to do as a way to serve not necessarily our artistic mission but our civic mission. I don't know if everyone here knows that Sculpture Center underwent an expansion recently too, and <laughs> and I think it's actually quite. I think it's kind of amazing because Sculpture Center was founded in 19, 1928, so it's very old, it's had different buildings, and it's been in Long Island City since the year 2000 in an old trolley repair shop. And um, last October, we opened a new lobby that was in the works for a while, and it's, it's a very modest expansion. It didn't really add that much square footage to our space, but it, it created an entryway for visitors, and it's actually it's actually radically transformed the institution in a lot of ways beyond what I, you know, I think what I imagined when I knew we were just building this box next to the, the gallery space. But I mean, that's, I'm just mentioning that to, to also speak to you know, a modest expansion or like how, at what pace you grow and, and what step leads to the next step as an institution. You know, how, how radical does the transformation have to be? Um, you know, there's also a capital campaign associated with that. But, um, but you know the next step might be like a building on top of the lobby. You know, it's just this, it's a slower pace of of growth. I think you know that's particular to Sculpture Center. That is interesting to know. Did it change it by creating more social space, which I actually think is a part of our museums. They are mm -hmm. places for social interaction. Yeah, I mean, I think it slows people down. The pacing mm -hmm. is completely different. The entry and the 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 preparation for the visitor to enter the exhibition is really um, different. And even though nothing fundamentally has really changed, I mean, the, the entry point is different. People spend a lot more time there. They look at the books on the shelves. You know, so it really, you know, it's, it's, it's I think, nice to see at that level some a small change like that can actually have a huge impact. And now there's a food seller in the neighborhood, too. So things are changing in Long Island City. <laughs> okay, do we have any more questions? Yeah, they are in the center aisle. Well, I may actually want to mirror back the question that Jens asked to Telma Golden back to Jens and ask about Jewish Museum because you're at the panel, we have a, a, a choice to ask you as well. Obviously, because of uh, your organizing an Orthodox exhibition and a very broad public programming around it, it's a signal, it's a statement in itself already. But I'm very curious in, in your commenting on your vision how much a Jewish museum is, can be, will be world or local museum and how much it is uh, limiting, how much it is uh, liberating and how is your uh, work with your, with your board in this context? Thank you. Well, one of the most wonderful things about working at the Jewish Museum is um, that the Jewish Museum, while it isn't a museum for art, it's also a museum for culture. And, and the possibilities to combine art with cultural history is something that's very unique to, to us. And I think also something that we really are proud of, having done a lot of exhibitions that sort of explore the larger cultural context around artists, around artworks, or you know, really go beyond just thinking about making exhibitions of artists. I'm thinking, for example, about the exhibition of Elena Rubinstein 
Einstein, um, where we presented her collection, her life, her, her salons. Um, and um, this gives us a lot of opportunity to move in many different directions. Um, to the point of uh, whether I feel restricted by being culturally specific, I would argue very similarly uh, to Thelma, no, not a, it gives me a, a great pass. It, it, it keeps me uh, sinking into a, one particular direction, but again, the, the possibilities are endless, uh, given that Jewish history and Jewish culture is, is so diverse and so rich uh, that, that you know, I never really come to the point where I feel like oh, I'm running out of ideas or you know, we, we have to repeat something that, that we have uh, already done. I think unorthodox is a really good example. Uh, we sort of like pick up on that um, dualism between orthodoxy and unorthodoxy, particularly in a moment when I think um, there is a focus on particular orthodoxies, whether they are religious or, or political, and trying to sort of uh, question that, investigate that, and, and you know, we expand something that perhaps is part of a Jewish dialogue, but bring it onto a larger, larger uh, platform. One of the most interesting conversations I've ever had with a colleague was the conversation Jens and I had early in his tenure where we, with no agenda necessarily, but decided that it would be interesting from our different institutional places with our curators to talk about this notion of cultural specificity, right? And how we could understand it, both in our individual institutions, but what was the conversation that we could have very specifically between the Studio Museum and the Jewish Museum, as both of our institutions have had to reinvent their sense of what cultural specificity means from the cultural point of view, not artistically, but culturally. And what's interesting is that the Whitney Museum is a museum of American art, and it, we often forget that because you've been very clever about <laughs> thinking what does American actually mean and, and, and expanded that notion, which of course it's not only clever, but it's also necessary. No, I mean, I think it's something we think about all the time, and in particular, since I've been there, and as in the lead up to the, to the new building, we've tried to think about it more creatively. I mean, I think that the, when the Whitney Museum was founded, it was founded because the, its patron, Gertrude Van Whitney, believed that there was a need to support American artists, that they were not recognized financially, critically, et cetera. Um, and today, obviously, people wouldn't make that argument. So sometimes you think, well, why would you found a Museum of American Art today? Maybe you, you wouldn't unless you were Alice Walton and you were making crystal bridges or something. And so we would kind of wonder, uh, is this a limitation? Is this a problem? Do we need to become more global? Even our name, American Art, is, is problematic, as we understand, because it's really the art of the United States, as the Whitney has always been defined. Um, we didn't change our name because uh, it goes back for a, a long way. And I think we felt at a certain point that we could get really neurotic about this limitation, or we could almost feel that it's kind of liberating, that unlike MoMA, we don't have um, institutionally the need to be responsible for the world in that way. Of course, we want to know about everything that's going on, but we don't have to have, uh, it would be very complicated for us to have curators that spoke every language and spent all the time that they could all around the world and that within a more narrow focus there was a lot of possibility but then how could we we reinvent that focus from within that the museum we know was founded with uh, many artists who were not born in this country uh, they never had to be citizens and we have to kind of uh, keep thinking about who the museum counts as an American artist how, at different times, it's, it's had different definitions, and we're in a process of trying to understand that better even now. By the way, there is no way in the world that MoMA can be everywhere in the world. And, you know, it's part of our, I think, um, part of the conversation that's going on is what makes the most sense given our own history both in terms of what we've collected, haven't collected, shown, haven't shown, uh, you mm -hmm, know. Mm -hmm. So I, I think if you think of us as having to be everywhere all the time, it's not going to work. But I mean, I think there are very distinct programs at MoMA PS1, very, you know, and I think I think focus is really important, even for an institution as seemingly I, large. I, I didn't mean to imply that you'd no, be everywhere no, in the world. And I mean, I remember talking about this with Jessica when she was in her Tate days, as they mm -hmm. felt the need in a city like London, it being the only institution of its kind in London, to expand to collecting arts of the Arab world or whatnot. But she didn't speak Arabic or read Arabic, and she was 
which doesn't mean you have to be to be an expert, but the, the level of expertise that was insisted upon in an institution like Tate Modern for collecting from large swaths of the planet was quite different than would have been uh, considered in, in there for Tate Britain, let's say, or even in collecting American art. Um, and I think that's quite interesting to think about, you know, where within the same institution there might be a double or triple standard in terms of the kind of mm -hmm. articulateness that we have in thinking about the things that we're responsible for. But that's why when we started these research programs, the effort was really to bring people from the outside in. Recognizing, and this was a big deal for the curators at some point, that we weren't experts and that we really had to depend upon other people. And it's something like 165 scholars, artists, and curators have come in the last seven years to do in-depth seminars, I, I think. Is there any more questions? <coughs> I have a question for you all, which is, what, what do you want from museums? <laughs> Everyone, at least five minutes each. <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> yeah, here the gentleman in the front. <clears throat> All right. Uh, hello. Uh, so, like, one of the things that I, I've seen, like, with uh, curatorial programs trying to be more diverse, and there seems to be more of an effort for diversity inclusion, but even in that, it could seem like uh, kind of marginalized. Um, like uh, one of the shows from Boston, I, w I won't name any names, was given a given a exhibition on the South, which included a number of uh, black artists, and I, I generally love their exhibitions. But like one of the things that I noticed about this exhibition was the flow of it wasn't good, and I felt like the narrative was being spoken from a white perspective about these people mm -hmm. as opposed to co-curating and having somebody tell their own story. So something like that, it's a, I think those things people notice and begin to make a difference. I think, you know, what you're responding to is like simply why the need to have more people around the table mm -hmm. is necessary. Because what you're responding to is not simply the curating of that exhibition. It was how it was laid out, how it was labeled, potentially how it was advertised, you know, how it was marketed, all of those factors, which institutionally require lots of levels of thought. And mm -hmm. even in the culturally specific environment, I'm not going to say we always get it right, but it does require having uh, enough people around the table with enough perspectives, and that is what we are lacking in our museums. Yep. We all know that. That is what has to be addressed. And in addressing it is when potentially those kinds of shifts um, will happen. What do you want from museums? Just, Anyone else? Mr. Dector has a question. Free entrance. You want free entrance. I agree with you. You're right. But that doesn't mean you shouldn't do it. That's not, that's not what I'm, I'm saying. I'm asking if there's a concern about this broadly moving forward. Well, uh, of course, if you live in this city and you work with people who can't any longer live here, but whom you would like to be involved in one way or another, of, of course, 
what's going, look, the, the greatest unorthodox thing going on today is Donald Trump. You know, it makes all of this other stuff a little crazy. No, I think he's the most orthodox. <laughs> but yeah, of course, I mean, I think we all do think about mm -hmm. the cities in which we live. I mean, mm -hmm. And I think when we're thinking about this issue, Josh, it, I mean, obviously we are concerned about it in the city in our own institutions, sure. but some of us were concerned about this in the whole country, yeah. right? That this is a kind of field-wide issue that takes on very different nuances when we start talking about um, other regions of the country, again, around what we hope to see in our institutions. So the city issue, yes, but nationally, we, we got to keep going. Right, we're going to give our last question to Vasif, because he asked. I mean, just to follow up on Josh's question, is, is uh, do you think of, uh, do you have any proactive uh, ideas about how to deal with this, how the city is changing in terms of how, where you put your doors? Where does the institution start, begin? Uh, I mean, or do you, or, or are you, are, I mean, this is a hypothetical question, obviously, or, or does the institution, is the institution the space in no. which in, it inhabits, or can programs be developed, other things can be developed, so that Josh's question can be addressed in a different way. I don't know how about the other museums, and one way I think that the Jewish Museum being here on the Upper East Side of Carnegie Hill, which is uh, probably one of the most uh, expensive areas to live in the city, we've sort of like been in this situation for a very long time, and other parts of the city might, might follow. Um, we've actually also done data, we do that a lot, um, and it's very useful um, when, when I get asked questions like this, because I can tell you that 80% of our audience doesn't even live in the city. Uh, they come from New Jersey, they come from Long Island, they come from the uh, other boroughs. Um, so um, those are also audiences that we, we are addressing and that we want to continue to address. I mean, there's, this is a sort of semi-lame answer to your question, but for example, um, if you were an artist in MoMA's collection, you have a membership for life, free. This year we developed a more expansive membership for artists, and I think it's $35 as opposed to whatever, recognizing that artists have um, a lot of expense just to be here. And so I think, you know, PS1 went free, you know, this um, membership is more or less accessible across a pretty wide um, spectrum. I, I would also add that a lot of the small to mid-scale institutions in Manhattan are facing um, mm. a lot of crisis, uh, crises in terms of their yeah. rents and are considering and you know, imminently having to move out of Manhattan. So that's it's just going to change. It's and artist space. Yeah. And, yeah. yeah, and that's going to, I mean, that's changing already a lot of, this has already happened, but it's continuing to happen. And, um, you know, the forecast is that there will no longer be these types of organi arts organizations within the borough of Manhattan. And I think that's something that is, is you know, it just sort of to talk about institutional diversity versus maybe, um, you know, demographics, but um, they, you know, and I think, I don't know what can be done, but there are a lot of groups organizing to try and advocate for their, um, you know, these organizations, and I, you know, we're actually part of, a Sculpture Center is a part of this, um, are advocating for um, some kind of acknowledgement or support, and it's been very difficult. It's not really coming, and I would say that it would be helpful if some of the larger institutions <laughs> gave like shout outs. I mean, there's like a, you know, there's like a need to acknowledge these spaces, I think, before they are forced to disappear. Mm -hmm. And it's one of the interesting things for me when we look at the sort of moment of the late 60s and many of the institutions now that are facing this issue, um, particularly that were downtown mm -hmm. and part of this kind of alternative unorthodox arts movement. At the time, certain qualities were seen as part of their founding values. It was very different in the culturally specific world of that moment where ownership, the idea that you had to buy your building, 
Mm -hmm. right? So <clears throat> when you look at Harlem and look at my peers and neighbors, the Dance Theater of Harlem, the Studio Museum in 68, the goal was you know, National Black Theater to buy and have an ownership stake that made you able to not only envision your future, but envision your future in light of what potentially could and would be this sort of transformation of neighborhoods that essentially might push you out. Well, thank you very much for all your patience. And um, thank you very much to all the speakers for coming out on Sunday.